Okay, hello, I'm Alan Litke, and I want to tell you a little bit about what, what the eye tells the brain, uh, and tell you a little bit how this is involved in actually the search for the Higgs boson. So, I'm going to start with very briefly telling you a bit about the, the, the visual system, about the eye, the retina, and then deciphering the eye's secret code. What is the secret code that the eye is sending to the brain to tell the brain about the external visual world? And uh, I'll explain about the technology uh, to actually figure this out was inspired by developing instrumentation specifically to search for the Higgs boson and many other things. And if time permits, I'll say a few words about, about retinal prosthesis. So here's very briefly the visual system. The outside world is focused by the lens in the cornea of the eye onto a thin piece of neural tissue called the retina. Uh, the retina is a remarkable neural structure, which I'll explain. Uh, it is not just a digital camera or what we physicists like to call a pixel detector. It's doing a lot more. It's doing extremely sophisticated processing of the visual information. And I'll try to explain a bit about that. So that uh, pixel detector is sending its information on a cable. Uh, the, the biologists call this cable the optic nerve, but as physicists will just call it a cable. And that information then goes to a relay station. Uh, biologists call this the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then the information goes on for further processing in the, uh, in the visual cortex. So that's a very brief, very brief overview. Here's the eye. There's a cornea and lens. Focus it, as I said, focus the outside visual world on a 300 micron thick piece of tissue, uh, which converts that light image into electrical signals. Those electrical signals travel down through uh, to this spot, the optic disc, where the optic nerve is formed. And all those output cables from all the neurons in the retina uh, wind up uh, traveling down as part of the optic disc to the brain. In order to get those cables out from your detector, your visual image detector, the retina, you have to make a hole in the retina. This is something that uh, Heinrich physicists building detectors like CMS or ATLAS, we learn to our peril about all of this because we got to bring the information from the inner part of the detector to the outside world. And that means part of our detector is going to be blind or have lots of material. The eye has that same problem. It hasn't solved it. And if you, wanna, if you don't believe it, come after the talk, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that to you. OK. So this is a cross-sectional view of the retina. They're the, uh, they're the photoreceptors that are going to convert the light photons into electrical signals. They are composed of rods and cones. The, ro the rods are active in low light situations, that the light that you would have at dusk and below. Uh, the cones, on the other hand, are only active during bright light situations. And there are actually three different types of cones, the red, green, and blue sensitive cones, light sensitive cones. and uh, they give us information about color. So that's where the initial stage of conversion of light into electrical signals happens. Then that's followed by three different stages of processing, horizontal cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, and all that highly processed information that I'll describe later winds up in the output cells of the retina, the ganglion cells. And the, these ganglion cells have an output cable. Biologists call these the axons of each neuron. And uh, 
this inside, the, if we look at the signals inside this, these axons, they will be actually digital signals, which I'll show you. And those axons form the optic nerve, as I said. So here's a cross a photographic photograph, a cross sectional photograph of the retina. Uh, photoreceptors, uh, these are the cell bodies of horizontal, bipolar, and amacrine cells. Ganglion cell, uh, cell bodies, nerve fibers are here, and there's incredible wiring that has to be performed. It's, this is, uh, in engineering or physicist language, this is a very sophisticated multi-layer printed circuit board where all the hundreds of thousands of cells in the ganglion cell layer have to meet up and get wired properly with the uh, bipolar and amacrine cell uh, uh, si signals coming down and so on. It's an amazing system, 300 microns thick. And this, this really blew me away when I first saw this. This is the pixel detector layout. These are cones in the, where we do the center of gaze, where we need the good spatial information. And you see here are the cones, closely packed, hexagonal, close packing. Center to center spacing is two and a half microns. I worked on a detect, high energy physics detector. We thought we were very clever. We packed, this was a, a detector looking for high energy photons and electrons. And we used crystals of sodium iodide. These we packed in hexagonal, these were hexagonally shaped crystals we packed them together like this. We thought we were very clever, because if you have circular cross-sectional crystals, you'd have holes. If you had square kind of crystals, you'd have funny edge effects at the corners. So we were very proud of ourselves. Then I realized, looking at this photograph, that biology had, in, had invented this 200 million years ago. Fortunately, the patent has expired, so we didn't have to pay royalties. Um, so, let's see where we stand. We have the outside visual world. He should be in, this should be a dynamic visual world, which is focused on the retina, as I said. And then, if we stick a probe to look at the electrical signals coming from one of the fibers in the optic nerve, we will see a, this time sequence of basically digital signals, which biologists are calling spikes. And so we will want to study what is the correlation between the input visual signals image, the movie, uh, and the output signals, these digital spikes that are traveling up the optic nerve to the brain. Now, what is really amazing is that, uh, well, we, we're going to understand in the research I'm going to explain to you a lot about what, how the, the retinal cells are transforming this image to produce these spiking signals. On the other hand, what the brain is doing is something much more sophisticated. It is taking one million signals of this form, all these spikes, electrical digital spikes are coming into the brain, one million from each eye, and figuring out from that information what is going on in the outside visual world. It's not exactly the physical visual world because a lot of transformations going on, but the brain is able to perceive from these digital, one million digital signals from each eye, is able to recreate the information about the outside visual world that's important for the survival of the animal. Absolutely incredible story. So that takes us to the retina project. So the goal of this project is to understand how the retina processes and encodes dynamic visual images. What is the secret code the retina is sending to the brain? Uh, the method we will use is to record the patterns of electrical activity, the spikes that are generated by hundreds of retinal uh, output cells, the retinal ganglion cells, as these cells and, and the retina, the neural circuitry of the retina responds to a movie that we will focus 
on the input neurons, that is the fold receptors. And we want to record this with, uh, record all this activity, spiking activity, with very good spatial resolution and temporal resolution over a large sensitive area. We learned in physics, if you have good spatial information, good time, res good time information, and you cover a large field of view, you're probably doing okay. The technology we use to do all of this is based on detector uh, technology uh, to detect charged particles traveling out of colliding beam reactions, as, as for example, present in, Atl in ATLAS or the LHC. These are called silicon microstrip detector, and the technology uh, that we are using was uh, based on this, these de de detectors that uh, were developed to do many things, including the search for the Higgs boson. So this is very much an example of the application of, techno of the expertise and technology coming out of Heinrich physics instrumentation to a completely different scientific field, which is in this case neurobiology. So we have, the outs we have a movie uh, that is going to be focused by a lens on, on the retina. That ren retina uh, is processing that image and uh, we detect the output signals uh, which are shown here. We detect those output signals on a fine fine-grained uh, array of electrodes. And then we try to look at, look at the output signals and correlate them with the input movie. So that's the plan. And this shows the, that retinal tissue sitting on top is a cross-sectional view of our electrode array. And this is just a piece of glass on which we have microfabricated a, a two-dimensional array of, uh, of electrodes. Now here's the high-energy physics technology uh, that inspired us to go in this direction. That was, these are silicon microstrip detectors specifically for colliding beam experiments. This was one of, this was one of the first devices uh, which goes back many, many years. This was a silicon strip vertex detector for an experiment on electron-positron annihilation at the uh, SLAC linear collider. And you see this is about the size of a, a Coke can. And one of, the, one of the key features of this is this, this multi-channel amplifier chip that looks with, with low noise at many different channels. This chip had 120 channels. So you can read out easily you know, hundreds and hundreds of channels. And then you have to connect each of those amplifier channels to the outside world, in this case to one of the strips on this silicon strip detector. And for that, we, we used high density wire bonding. Well, this technology has enormously grown, and this shows the, the Atlas semiconductor tra tracker. So it's not the size of a Coke can, it's one meter in diameter, it has 4,000. Uh, detect microstrip detector modules and six million channels. And in a, inside that, there's a pixel detector with 1,700 modules and 80 million channels. And this device in ATLAS, an equivalent device in CMS, were used in a critical role to search for the Higgs boson. And here is one of, one of the uh, Higgs, uh, Higgs candidate events into four muons. So this is the electrode. This is a section of a 512 electrode array, 60 micron separation from one electrode to the next. The electrode diameter is five microns. And this shows it uh, installed here on a uh, 3.2 centimeter glass piece. And here is high density wire bonding connecting the electrodes here to the outside world, in particular to multi channel uh, custom designed integrated circuits. So all of this makes a very compact arrangement. 
which you can see here. And for high-energy physicists, this is nothing. When biologists first saw this, they were astounded because no one, they had used big amplifiers and had huge cable plants to look at three, using three electrodes to look at three individual cells. Here we have one small printed circuit board. We could look at 512 electrodes and hundreds of, of neurons simultaneously. So that was the advantage of coming from high-energy physics. And since we have good spatial information, good time information, and a large field of view, we can actually do electrical imaging of each of the individual neurons that we have detected. And here you see one neuron, and we can uh, uh, we look at when this neuron makes a spike, an electrical spike. It's actually making electrical currents over a large region. And we can measure the, uh, at each of these electrodes, we can measure the electrical waveform. This corresponds to the cell body signal. Uh, this has opposite polarity. That is the dendritic structure of the neuron, the electrical activity coming from that. And here we see the output cable, the axon from this neuron. And you see the signal waveform is moving along in time. That's because this, we can see the signal propagation uh, down this chain uh, to, uh, to the optic disc. So how do we measure the, the properties of the, uh, the visual response properties of, this, uh, of the individual neurons? We're going to use a a time sequence of a very randomized checkerboard image as the visual input. So it's doing something like this. Um, and why do we do this? Well, we, we want to see what is the feature of the vid, visual image that, the, that this retinal cell is responding to. So any time a specific neuron makes a spike, we are going to record the sequence of visual images, which are the sequence of randomized checkerboard uh, images. We're going to record that sequence. Then another spike comes, we record that sequence of checkerboard images that led to that spike, and so on. We average all those sequence of images together and get the spike triggered average. And once we have done that, we see what is it, what was there, what was what was about that visual image, that movie, that, that, that this neuron was responding to in an average sense. And you see this is called an on-cell. And what this on-cell liked was to see a dark region in this part of the visual field on the lower left. And that's at 92 milliseconds minus, because zero is when the spike will occur. So it's seeing a dark spot here. After some time, it would like to see a bright spot. So it's looking for a transition from dark to bright in this specific region of the visual field. And then it's making a spike at zero. So that's telling us something about what, what, pro what processing this specific neuron is doing. And if I look at. So this is our very early data. We are looking at the light-sensitive regions, which we call the receptive fields, for, for 338 neurons that we have identified in this retina. And we represent that light-sensitive region by, by an oval, an ellipse. And we plot where that, where that sensitive region for each of the 338 identified neurons actually is located. Uh, uh, on the visual field, and also where, um, uh, what the size and orientation is, and so on. Well, it looks like the designer of this uh, retina was not very good. There's all kind of randomized stuff going on. Maybe he was, he or she was drunk. We don't know. But the real, but it turns out that we are the ones who are not doing the right job because. We can, if we go and examine 
the spatial and temporal response properties of the individual neurons using the spike trigger average that we've measured, we can see wh what, what's going on in the design. So let's look at this cell, and you see dark going to bright. That's just what I showed you, and it's covering a certain area of the visual field. That is an on-parasol cell. But now we can go to another cell, and that has a very different response. It goes from its same kind of area of sensitivity, but it's going from bright to dark. So that is known as an off-parasol cell. Well, let's see if we can find any other cells. What about this one? Well, that's going from bright to dark, so that's an on cell, but it's a much smaller sensitive region, so that's going to become our on midget cell. And then we go to yet another cell, and that is going from bright to dark, uh, therefore an off cell, but also small. That is our off midget cell. And finally, we go to this cell, and you actually can see some blue. So this is a blue-sensitive cell. So we can divide up all those cells into five completely independent categories of cell types, which provide different spatial and temporal information about the outside visual world. But each cell type is tiling the visual field. Each cell type I mean, this was our very first data, so we're not very efficient. I'll show you much prettier mosaic patterns of, of cells. But each, each cell type, and here are five cell types, each cell type is looking at the visual world, take, extracting from its particular features in space and time, and then sending that image uh, over the whole visual field to the brain. So the brain is actually seeing five completely different sets of images, each one having its own independent type of information. That's why it's more sophisticated than a digital camera. And in fact, that's just the tip of the story. It turns out that uh, I showed you five classes of retinal ganglion cells. But from anatomical studies, we knew that there were at least 22 different types of retinal ganglion cells. That means 22 different Im sub images traveling to the brain that the brain can then put together, interpret with, the, with, the, with visual perception. And uh, so this is cross sectional views of 22 anatomically types, but almost nothing was known except for the five classes I showed you about the physiological properties or the functional properties of these cell classes. So part of our work using the instrumentation coming out of Heinrich Physics, we can look for new cell types, functional cell types that had not been observed before. And lo and behold, this is an upsilon cell that we found. It has a receptive field area, which is about an order of magnitude larger than the parasol cell that I referred to before. And here you see in three independent retinal preparations, we see these beautiful mosaics of the parasol cells, but also we see three independent mosaics of this upsilon cell. And so given that it has such a large receptive field, the area, sensitive area, it's not good for spatial information. And the properties of the cell suggest that it's probably involved in motion detection. And so we can look at some of these animations of uh, each cell. These are these this electrical images. This shows, uh, you see the cell body uh, sending, responding and sending its signal towards the optic nerve. We go to the upsilon cell, and again, we see much larger electrical activity, but sending the signal in the same direction uh, down a single axon. That gave us confidence that we were doing something sensible, because uh, we know that in the retina, all the ca output cables want to go towards that optic disk, that blind spot. But then, to our great surprise, 
we found something totally different. This was a cell that was sending its signals over multiple axons over large areas covering the whole extent of our uh, two square millimeter uh, electrode array. So these are, these are under detailed study now. See what getting as much information from that class of cells as we can. Uh, okay, in addition, what we've been able to do is measure the, cir the neural circuitry responsible in part for color. And so we've been, we've been able to measure the connection strength between each cone in a re region of the retina. Uh, and that includes red, green, and blue sensitive cones, each one of which is represented by a red, green, or blue dot. And each cone is connected by a white line to one of the uh, parasol cells, off parasol, on midget, or off midget cells. So we have a complete wiring diagram of cones to these four classes of retinal output cells in a localized piece of, of the retina. Okay, so f let me take you now to retinal prosthesis. Uh, once you're starting to understand how the retina works, you also want to see if you can contribute to fixing the retina or uh, in cases where the retina is, is not working properly due to, uh, due to some kind of disease, for example. There are two terrible diseases, retinitis pig pigmentosa or age-related macular degeneration, where the uh, photoreceptors are degenerating, leading to blindness of the patient. And so, for many years, many people, we haven't been involved in, in the biomedical aspects. We've been involved in the physiology, the basic underlying neurobiology. But the, there's many groups that are developing retinal prosthetic devices to produce artificial sight for the blind, for patients that have these types of diseases. And so the patient will have a video camera mounted on some glasses. The visual image will be digitized by the camera, sent to a processor. Uh, that processor will create uh, stimulation pulses, electrical stimulation pulses that will be wirelessly transmitted through the skull, through RF uh, coils, radio frequency coils, and lead to a cable that will carry those electrical stimulation signals to uh, an electrode array that has been implanted against the, uh, against the retina. And the stim electrical stimulation signals applied to the retinal cells will, uh, core, will lead to the spiking activity of those cells, and those spikes will then go up the optic nerve, and the patient, in principle, should, should start to see. This sounds like science fiction, but it's not science fiction. Uh, this is, uh, this is there's a company called Second Sight that has produced a system called the Argus II Retinal Prosthesis System that was approved several months ago by the U.S. Federal Drug Administration as a humanitarian device. This has been uh, this, there are about 30 patients that have had this installed and the various perceptual measurements done uh, as a humanitarian device for retinitis pigmentosa. This can go on up to 4,000 patients a year. So this is not science fiction. And these patients have a, uh, this is a camera mounted on the glasses. Uh, the signal is fed to the processor. The processor sends signals back up to a, a radio frequency coil going across the skull into the region of the eye that gives sig stimulation signals that then go are distributed to this, this uh, 
the stimulating electrode array, and that electrode array is attached surgically to the back to the retina uh, through a, a, a surgical retinal tack. And the stimulated neurons, the ganglion cells for these diseases are functioning properly. Uh, and so those signals that have been stimulated are sent up the optic nerve. These patients, many of whom have been totally blind for 30 years, can actually even, if you have, they look at on a computer screen at large letters, and they can with some, some reasonable probability by moving their head back and forth actually see you know, identify those letters. They can see where a door is. This is, this is a big deal, I think. Uh, on the other hand, from our point of view, this is really wonderful stuff, but it's not the end of the story. The, dis the detector system, the electrode system I described to you had 60 micron spacings from one electrode to the next, five micron diameter electrodes. The implanted electrodes have diameters of 200 microns, electrode spacing of 500 microns. It's clear that, uh, that large currents have to be sent in, and you're not, stimulated, not stimulating individual cells, retinal cells. You're stimulating thousands and thousands of cells, and so you're not getting very good spatial information. So we've for several years, we've been working on developing the technology and doing experiments to try to see how, what if we had lots of small electrodes, which we already have, with good, you know, with small spatial separation, which we already have, and we have a lot of electrodes. Well, we have all of that. And so the previous system I described, we could record the neural activity. This new system, we can, uh, we can send in stimulation pulses independently to each of the 512 electrodes and simultaneously record the information coming back from the retinal cells. So we're starting to get interesting results, but I think I'm out of time. So let me just say that uh, I mentioned the blind spot that's where all the uh, signals from the output cables have to go through a hole to get out to the brain. Uh, and if you have never seen this, I invite you to come, come up now and see the blind spot test and show where your, the hole in your retina actually is located. I also have some optical illusions that I'm very happy to share with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> uh, I didn't implant them, believe me. <laughs> yes. Let me go back. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, how does this capture the entire field of view, uh, no. the optical field of view, the like Fourier transform, uh, or something along those lines, that because you work in different space, uh, gets information from the entire field of view? No, I mean the the retina is topographic. The the retina the the retina is designed to look at very you know to be mapped to the outside visual world in a one to one correspondence, except for these twenty two classes of different cells. But every cell class maps its receptive field to a specific point, and then that tiles the whole region. So this is a small part of the whole visual uh, of the of the, the retina. But this is, as I said, this is the first step. And uh, people talk about much more ambitious uh, uh, retinal prosthetic devices. But e even something like this, 
I mean, you can say it's very primitive, and it is very primitive. I said it has poor spatial resolution. You pointed out it has small active error. That's all true. But for someone who's been blind for 30 years, to be able to see is really dramatic. And, you know, may, every year this is going to get better, especially now that people can get money from this because it's now approved. Next week, Medicare will start paying for these things. They really function. Well, they are, they are safe. A humanitarian device is a device that's safe, uh, but not necessarily effective. Yes? Yes, these are blind. Yes, yeah, I mean, some people do much better than others. Uh, in some cases, the surgery doesn't work properly. So uh, it's still a very young field, I would say. And uh, why is it different from one patient to another? We, we, I certainly don't know this. That's a very good point because you are sending the information that you think the patient wants to see. But if the patient has been blind for many years, maybe he or she interprets these spikes coming into the brain very differently than you would, than a normal retina actually uh, is displaying the information. There are many interesting issues, but. Uh, but at least now, there, as I said, there are 30 patients that have had these installed for about one and a half years. So it's not a short-term short thing. And they are starting to move around and, you know, even, as I said, to, to start to read. So over time, I think this will become very important. And there are examples, cochlear implants, which are, have made the tens of thousands of people with cochlear implants that have made a tremendous difference if they're implanted early enough. And there's, Parkin, there's deep brain stimulators that uh, are used for treatment of Parkinson's disease. There are deep brain stimulators remarkably able to, to stop depression in some very special cases. I mean, there's, there's a dramatic, dramatic things are happening in the biomedical applications of, of devices like this. Yes? <laughs> to neurobiology? <laughs> That's my wife asking the question, so. <laughs> It came about because I saw my children, thanks to my wife, growing up. <laughs> what? Well, when, when I started this, I was working with someone who had, who was working with 61 electrodes and de detecting 10 neurons at a time. And I said, how many neurons should we be detecting? How many neurons are there in the retina? I said, well, there's a million. So I said, well, we have a little ways to go then. And, uh, uh, and, and I said, well, maybe, you know, maybe I can figure out a way to do this better. I mean, we had individual amplifiers and big cables, as I described, as we had in Hydro Physics. And I knew how to make this improvement, at least by an order of magnitude, because we had done this in developing that silicon microstrip detector system that, that I showed you before. So once you know what the problem is, and you want to solve the problem, then you, 
you try to think about what possible solutions could, could work. And as you come, biologists wouldn't think in, those, in that way because they didn't know you could make high density wire bonding. They didn't know you could make these, you know, 64, 128 channel integrated circuits and all of that. I was a high energy physicist. I knew you could do that. And, we, and, and with my collaborators and colleagues, we had done that. So I knew this was very possible and we had the expertise in the high energy physics community to actually carry that out. So I think the message for youngsters here, walk across the street, <laughs> go from your atlas work and walk across the street and talk to scientists in other fields. You might be amazed what you can contribute. Or since you're in Geneva, walk up the lake <laughs> to Lausanne where the Human Brain Project is underway, which is in desperate need, I think, of people who understand how to work with large quantities of data.